Hi, class. Um, so where we left off, we had been talking about Santa Ana, and um, when we're thinking about Santa Ana, if we were to compare him to the colonists during the revolution, he would be like a loyalist because he still heavily depends on Spain um, rather than Mexico, just like how certain colonists were still very loyal to England even though they had come to America. So Santa Ana is after anyone who is going to defy Spain. Um, and as we move on uh, to chapter three, we'll notice that the chapter's title is The Raven Preens Its Feathers. In 1812, when Houston was 19, he astonished rural Tennessee with an act that demonstrated the insolence with which he tre treated society. To pay off his debts, he opened a school. Never himself having completed a full year of education, he nevertheless presumed to teach others on the grounds that he could figure, knew the English language better than most, and could recite large portions of the Iliad. When he set the fees for his school, parents learned they were $2 higher than any other in the district, $8 a term to be paid in three portions, cash, corn at 33, and one-third cents a bushel, and cloth of varied colors for the teacher's clothing. It seemed highly unlikely that such a bold venture could prosper, but the would-be teacher was so tall, so stern of voice, and so capable of keeping order among unruly children that his roster was quickly filled and the school enjoyed an obvious success. With a sour wood cudgel in his hand, dressed in rough trousers and a long hunting jacket, hair braided in a long queue down his back, he dared his scholars not to learn. He said later that this was one of the happiest periods of his life, but he must have worked at night to keep one day ahead of his students. A traditional scholar he was not, when he tried to grapple with geometry, he found its theoretical reasoning too difficult and could not get past the first abstract problem. Even so, at the end of the first year, it was obvious that this Homer spouting backwoodsman would be able to continue his school with considerable profit. But, like young Santa Ana down in Veracruz, he longed for the excitement of the battle. The United States was again at war with England, and reports of the Eastern engagements filtered into the West. When he heard that fellow Tennessean General Andrew Jackson was fighting both the British and the Indians, Houston closed his school and lifted from the drumhead of the recruiting surgeon to silver dollar that obligated him to obey military law from then on. By associating himself with Andrew Jackson, he required a model for his military and political behavior. Jackson had been a lawyer, a judge, a general, a deadly duelist, and an avid horse racer, a heavy drinker, and a frontier political herringer, herringer. Adopting Jackson's style, Houston would master most of those skills. He entered the United States Army in its lowest rank, but in less than four weeks, his imposing size and knowledge of guns brought him promotion to drill sergeant. He soon became an officer, and as an ensign in his first battle, followed his major in a mad dash against enemy ramparts. The major was shot dead at point-blank range, but Houston carried on and won the position. In doing so, he took a heavily barbed Indian arrow in his left thigh, half an, half an inch from the groin. Pull it out, he shouted at a lieutenant nearby, but this hesitant officer, after giving only two tugs, cried, Impossible. It'll have to be cut out. Pull, dang it, yelled Houston, reaching for his sword to force the nervous superior officer to do the job. Placing one foot against Houston's leg, the officer grabbed the arrow with both hands and jerked with all its strength. Out it came, bringing with it so much thorn, sorry, so much torn flesh that Houston almost fainted. A surgeon, packing the gaping hole with cotton, commanded him to lie here till the battle's over. General Jackson, passing by in hurried inspection of his troops before the final push, took one look at Houston's wound and also ordered him to stay out of the battle. But Houston could not remain inactive while a fight was raging. Struggling to his feet, his wound dripping blood, he rushed haphazardly into the fray and found himself 
leading a forlorn charge up a ravine, at the far end of which the enemy waited, well ensconced. In trying to force the position, Houston took a full volley which shattered his right arm and sent a large bullet into his right shoulder. Because of his conspicuous bravery at this crucial battle of Horseshoe Bend in 1814, he was promoted both to lieutenant and to the close friendship of General Jackson, whose rising star he would follow thereafter. As a young officer familiar with Indian ways, he was dispatched as government spokesman to his old friends, the Indians of the Cherokee Nation, to explain the new treaties the United States was offering them. Gladly, he resumed the breech clout and blanket way of life, and in his sorry, and in this mood and costume, he reported to Washington in 1818 as an interpreter to help conclude arrangements profitable to both Indians and the American army. Wearing Indian dress, his hair in a long Cherokee queue adorned with shells, he presented his chieftains to President Monroe. Although the president was pleased with Houston's effectiveness, the Secretary of War was outraged and at the close of sorry, and at the close of the meeting asked Houston to remain. The secretary was John C. Calhoun, the brilliant, acidulous, furiously ambitious pol politician from South Carolina, one of the ablest men ever to aspire to the presidency only to lose it because of his venomous personality and his shift from a broad nationalism to a narrow southern pro-slavery stance. How dare an officer of the United States Army appear in his nation's capital in such garb? I came with Indians, representing Indians. They trust me because I, too, am an Indian. Never appear before me again in such obscene dress. Sir, I was able to conclude this treaty. I am your commanding officer, the tight-lipped, beady-eyed secretary snapped and I command you to get out of that debasing costume. Instead, Houston got out of the army for he would accept such speed, sorry, he would accept such speech from no one, not even General Jackson, and certainly not from some scrawny, arrogant politician. Still dressed in Indian robes, he soon penned his letter of resignation to Calhoun, initiating an enmity that would, an enmity, that would color American politicians for two generations. Sam Houston hated John C. Calhoun and worked to deny him the presidency. Calhoun despised Houston and revel reveled in the disasters that were to overtake him. Houston's resignation took effect in 1818 when he was 25 with no land, no job, no wife, and very few prospects. Within a few weeks, however, he had persuaded a Nashville lawyer of considerable reputation, Judge James Trimble, to instruct him in law. The judge spelled out the 18-month course of study required in those days, and Sam plunged, plunged in, read assiduously, and at the end of six months announced he had learned all there was to learn, and that he was prepared to serve the people of Tennessee as a lawyer. After a cursory examination of the young giant, Judge Trimble and his associates at the Nashville Bar agreed. Sorry, I was just checking how much we had. Um, one of the first things he did as a lawyer was to write several hell blistering letters to Secretary of War Calhoun, demanding to know why monies owed him to the sorry, demanding to know why monies owed him by the War Department had not been paid. One letter ended. I can see no reason for the conduct pursued by you. I could have forgotten the unprovoked injuries inflicted upon me if you were not disposed to continue them. Your personal bad treatment, your official injustice, I will remember as a man. One startling aspect of Houston's years as a young lawyer was rarely referred to, but in view of this, his later deportment, was of marked significance. When Sam was a handsome 25, unmarried, well on his way to secure a to secure profession, a group of similar young fellows launched the Dramatic Club of Nashville, whose members offered the city a variety of first-rate English and American plays. In one, high in one highly successful venture, Houston was supposed to appear as a drunken, aggressive, hilarious porter in a role that had been much enlarged to allow him scope for his gift for comedy and imitation. At the time for presentation approached, 
he grew apprehensive about appearing before the public in a ridiculous posture and he might have withdrawn from fear of being laughed at had not the other actors convinced him that he would prove the hit of the show because of his size, his gift with words, and his impressive voice. He was the star, applauded by the audience, lauded by the newspaper, and praised by the club's director, who said publicly that he had never met a man who had a keener sense of the ridiculous, nor one who could more readily assume the ludicrous or the sublime. However, the Nashville play that created the deepest impression on Houston, helping form his attitudes towards honor, self-deportment, and public oratory, was the sensational success that had swept the nations of Europe as well as the cities of America. It was John Holmes Douglas, a histronic masterpiece of the Scottish Highlands in which various actors were accorded opportunities to move front and center to deliver orations that competed in popularity with Hamlet's to be or not to be. In Douglas, the honest young hero, handsomely kilted, stepped forward to deliver words familiar to audiences of the time. My name is Norval. On the Grampian Hills, my father feeds his flock, a frugal swain whose constant cares were to increase his store and keep his only son, myself, at home. But brash young Norval, would have none of this. Breaking away and plunging into battle, he uttered the cry which resounded through the theatres of the time where, wherever English was spoken, like Douglas conquer or like Douglas die. Houston did not play Norval. He had a lesser role as Glen Ballon, but each night he heard this stirring line, this avowal of honor and its rhythm became part of his arsenal. When he finished with the Democratic Club of Nashville, his knowledge of oratory and his commanding presence aided his election by his fellow officers of the Tennessee militia as their major general. He would henceforth be General Houston, a title reinforced through bravery in the field and leadership in the barracks. The civilian population regarded him so highly as an advocate in court that they elected him in 1823 to the United States House of Representatives from Tennessee's 9th District. Nashville's most eligible bachelor made his maiden speech in the United States Congress in his very early 30s. What was the subject? Not some parochial Tennessee problem, but the right of Greeks to seek independence from Turkish rule. Throughout his political career, he would continue to advocate for freedom for all, except black slaves. He was felt by many and voiced publicly by some that Sam Houston's star could rise to the very zenith. Senator, governor, member of all cabinet, even presidency. But in the fall of 1824, his spectacular rise foundered. His choice for the presidency, Andrew Jackson, was denied that high office by the strategy of Door, John Quincy Adams of Massachusetts, a lifelong enemy of all that Houston aspired to, and Henry Clay, who wished to become Secretary of State. And who became vice president with extraordinary powers in the inner circle? John C. Calhoun, more determined than ever to oppose the brash young congressman from Tennessee. Undaunted, Houston plunged back into national politics with but two objectives, to make his hero Jackson president in 1828 and to make himself governor of Tennessee as soon as possible. He would also give careful consideration to finding himself a wife of whom his Tennessee constituents would approve.